Hello, welcome to a special CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, co-host of the CUBE, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media Cube. We're here at Naveen Chudda, Managing Director of Mayfield, Mayfield Ventures. Naveen, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. So first of all, I love talking to the guys who are writing checks, funding the next winners. Uh, great, great to get some insight from you, so thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. So you guys, um, Mayfield, um, have had changes over the past 20 years. You had original founders and then mm -hmm. evolved 50 years now. Mm -hmm. Mayfield, like the blue, blue chip venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. What's the current situation in terms of the numbers? Fund under management, how many partners? Give some quick numbers. Absolutely. So currently Mayfield, uh, we're just entering the 50th year, next year if you will. Currently we are like six investment partners. We have a team of three partners were focused on operational services and marketing, business development, and talent, and we have an operating partner. So 10 people sort of were running essentially the firm. Currently investing our 15th venture fund, which is over $400 million, and also investing from a later stage select fund, which is $125 million, investing in select companies in our portfolio. Got it, so you guys are looking at early stage, also growth, also have operational support which is key these days, mm -hmm. rapid growth. It's not like the old days mm -hmm. where you know, you're doing A round, which is like a seed round, and then the B round, maybe C round is growth. Now you're getting growth in the early days, mm -hmm. early rounds. So that seems to be the standard you guys are doing, right? It's very, very important, right? Like Mayfield has a philosophy of being a people first firm. We get involved early stages of the company, primarily at series A, and you need to help the companies. All of our partners have been entrepreneurs, have been execs, they have worked at startups, but then you can only be on so many boards and do so many things yourself. Okay. So that's where we complement ourselves with other operating execs who have done this at successful companies and seen excellence and can bring those best practices to our portfolio companies. That's also a great thing. You're being a little bit humble, I'll also add that you guys have good tech chops. You see some, you know the trends and you're mm -hmm. on top of things. So, so I think that's the key as well. You got to know, know the tech, what the tech trends mm -hmm. are. Um, so I got to ask you, what's your investment thesis right now for you as a partner? I know you do certain gigs, other partners would do some healthcare and some other things, but you're investing in what we love, which is cloud native, mm -hmm. <laughs> blockchain, machine learning, AI, all the cool stuff, IOT. So you're, in, you're right where we're, we're programming to, mm -hmm. so our audience is interested. What is your investment thesis when, when a startup comes in or later stage growth company comes in? What do you look for? What are some of the investment theses that you're going after? So I'm very focused on people because my strong belief is people make products, products don't make people. And companies are built by great people who want to change the world. So I start with people, end with people. And the people we bet on are climbing new hills. And our job is to figure out, are these going to become real hills? or they're going to be just vaporware, if you will. So the current areas where I'm spending a lot of time are applications of AI and ML, autonomous being a key one, if you will. Cybersecurity is another one as an application of AI and ML. The second area where I'm spending a lot of time is decentralized web or web 3.0 driven by blockchain computing. Another area is the post Moore's law era, which is the second innings of silicon. People thought Silicon Valley is dead. No more silicon investments. The, it's becoming a media valley. The world is changing. So in the post Moore's Law era, there's a lot of innovation that is happening. And silicon again is in vogue, if you will. Also spending time on cloud native and microservices because believe the whole tech stack is essentially being redefined. So it's a very exciting time to be an investor in the enterprise space. Well, it's a nice thesis because it kind of threads together. You've got cloud data, which is going to basically bring scale and compute. Mm -hmm. um, the silicon kind of fits into that because it's you know, obviously at the edge and also in the data center. And then that's going to enable ML and AI. The Absolutely. App, so the stack needs to support that. Mm -hmm. And then blockchain is potentially the next potential hill, mm -hmm. which is not distributed computing, it's decentralized. Yeah, and it's the whole thing people have talked about. It's edge computing, peer-to-peer -peer computing, and it's going to redefine the economics of centralization, and it's going to disintermediate 
some of the bigger players. So you, one thing that you didn't bring up, and I want to throw this at you because I think this is interesting, is that we were just talking with Google this morning, I was at a, a briefing, because Google Next is coming out. Data and big data has been a, a, a sector. And do Absolutely. Kind of know how that turned out. It's now called AI. Right? Mm -hmm. So a little bit of marketing, but I think AI is legit, no problem. But data as a category, data warehouse, and I think that's kind of older, but it's still a big mm -hmm. enough market. But there's a whole new category emerging that's the intersection of data center, cloud, blockchain, and AI, and that is horizontally scalable data. Does that stand on its own in your thesis, or is that just a native piece of the thesis that you're looking at? Yeah, so my belief is, if I look at the last decade, it was driven by cloud, mobile, social, and big data. And in my mind, big data is like crude oil, but when you can do something with it, it becomes refined oil, and that's AI, if you will. So to me, cloud, social, mobile, and big data are just enablers of the things you and I just discussed. That sounds like the original Silicon Angle uh, editorial framework. Totally agree, that, that's at the table. Mm -hmm. It's table sticks, right? Like basically, we have a lot of data, compute, storage, and memory are cheap. GPUs are available, now you can crunch things which weren't just possible before at very low costs. So you can solve problems that humans couldn't solve, yeah. using AI and ML. And these new abstraction layers are interesting because when you get software involved, with open source software, you have now more software innovation. How is that impacting, say, blockchain for instance? One of the things that we're very bullish on blockchain and uh, token economics, we think that's a whole nother SaaS-like mm -hmm. impact. We think token economics, although separate from blockchain as a technology, is a kind of a, the next SaaS kind mm -hmm. of impact. Still is unproven. Mm -hmm. What makes you so bullish on blockchain? Yeah, so I would say the first inning of the blockchain was all about Bitcoin in 2009. It was seen as another asset, gold 2.0, if you will. Then came Ethereum in 2013 with smart contracts. But the five, six years of blockchain were all about speculation of Bitcoin, Ethereum, exchanges were created, you had money transfers, remittance. But now what's going to happen is a new wave of distributed applications are going to get created where they're not going to be controlled by a big power. So could there be a new Google? Could there be a new Facebook? Could there be a new WhatsApp? Where there's no central authority and there's disintermediation and decentralization and the end people essentially own it. But to make it happen, the world is not ready. What do you need? You need the infrastructure to enable decentralized and peer-to-peer -peer computing, which is based on trust this time. Because what is blockchain? It's an immutable distributed ledger. Everybody understands what a distributed ledger is, but it's immutable, which means you need proof of work, you need consensus to change anything. So we are entering an era of peer-to-peer -peer computing, which is going to be trust-based and consensus-based. And in order to solve that problems in the past, there was a lot of development that used to happen at the protocol layer, like TCP IP, HTTPS, HTTP, UDP, but those things were never monetizable. You had to essentially go build applications and system software to monetize it. But today, with the way the world is going in blockchain, the way we are seeing it with Ethereum, people can monetize the protocols. So the opportunities are not only going to be the application layer, there'll be opportunities at the protocol layer, there'll be op opportunities at the data layer, and the developer layer. So if I look at the stack, it starts with apps, but the apps can't be built till you have infrastructure. So it's going to be protocol innovation, infrastructure to help scale it, make it secure. Then what do I do with all the data that is going to be stored in a decentralized way? And then on top of that, what does the whole dev tooling look like? And eventually, they'll be decentralized apps. I think the proof points are there. You're starting to see the developer community, certainly Ethereum attracted developers, that's smart contracts, decentralized application, mm -hmm. check, signals, mm -hmm. see that. But the question is, is that is, well let me just ask a question. Define for a second, because you mentioned some, first of all, I love what you said, it's great. Define what you mean by protocol, because the internet protocols you mentioned were based on standards mm -hmm. and couldn't be monetized, you couldn't need those to run. Now the internet's an operating system, so right. I agree 100% with what you said. But explain for the folks out there, what does that mean, internet uh, protocol for blockchain or protocol for? Yeah. So let's see how work gets done on the internet, right? When the browser came out, the reason it had to be built, because nobody could use the HTTP protocol, right? And the only way Netscape and then eventually Microsoft could monetize it 
is by selling the browser. And then that became free and all the opportunity went to the server side. And that's what led to the demise of Netscape, right? In today's world, if I am a protocol developer, say I create Ether, I can have coins that people can have, not only as security coins, but also as access coins that they can come, use my protocol, and the value of these coins will go up based on the assumption how successful my protocol is. So think. Give what, an example of what a protocol is. Is it Ether, or is it, can I create a protocol? No, Ether is a good example, right? Like of a thing which is happening at the protocol platform layer, and there are many, many others, right? So let me give an analog which will be easy. Databases were very hard to use, generally by people. So what happened, a whole industry started around application software, which OEM'd the technology from Oracle, from many other database companies, mm -hmm. and built real applications. That's what is going to happen here. These protocols will be the operating system inside or the database inside on which developers are going to build applications, and this time, for them to support these protocols, they're getting incented because somebody else will go buy the coin and if these protocols succeed, it's a greater fool's theory, it'll become more and more valuable as usage happens. Well, that's token economics, but I think that there's, there's, there's certainly some underbelly fraud going on in the coin market, but monetizing the protocol I think is legit and mm -hmm. it's going to happen, I agree with you. I think that's the real value. You have the immutable blockchain, mm -hmm infrastructure piece, the token economics with the protocol, mm -hmm. that's going to create a lot of advantage. I, I totally believe that. We are convinced by the data that we see that you said mm -hmm. it's actually going to happen. The question I have for you is, as an investor, how do you invest in that? Do you just say, buy some tokens? So you're a, uh, an venture capital investor, you invest in equity. Mm -hmm. They have security tokens now, and they have utility tokens. Yep. So you have a dual token market, you got T0 might launch a security exchange, mm -hmm. potentially new liquidity. As the managing director of Mayfield, how do you deal with that? Do you look at it and say, hmm, do I put a couple bets out there? Do I take equity? What's your strategy? So at least for us, we have decided we are in an early innings of a decade to two decade long opportunity. So we are sticking to our nets of essentially investing in the equity rounds. That's where the value gets created, help these companies get formed. And as what happened in biotech, IPOs used to happen as financing events. Mm -hmm. Companies weren't created on that. The same thing is our thesis will happen in this area. You start with equity rounds, you essentially help put teams together, you create the technology, you get product market fit, but instead of an IPO, you go to an ICO, but it's a financing event. Yeah. It's not a liquidity yeah. event, if you will. It's project financing. It's, well, this is the thing that we talked about. Same thing in biotech. Well, this is interesting. I want to get your thoughts and reaction to this. So in New York at the Blockchain Week consensus event, we had the Cube down there, one of the founders said, um, the token is a project financing. You're bringing up another thing, which is another potential funding, is company finance. You're a company financer. You invest mm -hmm. in people and founders to build a company. Yep, we want to be on the cap table. But we want to be aligned I, with them. No, but that's a vehicle you understand, so I, that's, that's cool, I get that. But now you have another potential opportunity mm -hmm. with project financing. So it's, it smells like open source. So a lot of the guys are doing project financing mm -hmm. and trying to do company things at the same time. So I think there's some, some inefficiencies with that. Yeah, and I think this will be in both places, right? Like, so it's not just going to be equity financing. It won't just be ICO financing. There is going to be some kind of regulation that'll happen because it's very hard in ICO when there's no banker, there's no VC. We're just raising money from general public. Have they even done their due diligence? Yeah. How do you even value something like this? Well, the game what is What if over. there's a fraud? Well, we report on SiliconANGLE, we've been reporting, and this is the current, is that the utility tokens game is over. It is financing, and that's been ruled by the mm -hmm. SEC. The security token is going classic accredited investor. Yep. Um, that is a securitized, securitized mm -hmm. investment with the utility upside once the utility capability exists. Mm -hmm. Potentially two liquidities or conversions, all kinds of things. So that's kind of out there. The, the interesting thing is, is that how will the liquidity come out? That's something we're looking at. And how does the team fund itself because again, product market fit is day one mm -hmm. or day zero still. You still got to go out and scale. You still got to get customers. You have a global uh, framework. You got domiciles issues. Mm -hmm. So this is complicated. It's very complicated, right? The good news is, as I mentioned er earlier, it's still very, very early. We are in the first innings. There was some hype 
on the, the prices of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. Ether, and all the other cryptocurrencies going up, but the real companies and the real applications still have to be built. And what's going to happen is, in the future, my prediction is just on a white, pa white paper, you're not going to be able to raise an yeah. ICO. True. You'll have to build a real product, get some real product market fit, get some initial customers, and then yes, ICO could be a means of funding, but it'll come with its own bells and whistles. Yeah, you got to show some, some, some exit potential on either revenue and or appreciation mm -hmm. and some sort of token. I still think there's a great market there. I'm bullish on both. I think it's a, you have a great thesis over there. Obviously other VCs are jumping in. We see Andreessen Horowitz. I think Excel just got in on the um, and Amazon kind of mining uh, deal. Mm -hmm. I just saw that go out. So Silicon Valley looking like they're putting the toe in the water for yeah, blockchain. I think like and you have any coming you can share with us? Or? Yeah, we have a few in stealth, <laughs> but you'll be hearing soon about them. So you've put some money into some blockchains? Yeah, but into equity rounds. Equity rounds, okay, great. All right, let's get to AI. First, I'd like to talk about blockchain all day long. It's my favorite topic. Um, AI and machine learning. Machine learning really is the meat on the bone. AI is, you can debate on whether AI mm -hmm. truly exists yet. Um, how does the machine learning and AI, the, the, taking that crude oil, the data, and making it scale with applications, how is that going in your mind? And does that tie with a new silicon model you see? Mm -hmm. Talk about those two dynamics. Absolutely. So I would say one of the things that has happened already is the AI models from companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, there's a lot of research that has been put out there. So the technology exists. And if you look at the basic science of it with neural networks and other things existed 30 years back, existed 40 years back but compute was very expensive. There were no GPUs, right? There were no ML processors, mm -hmm. but today the world has changed. Fast forward 40 years. Now the critical thing in my mind is, which entrepreneurs are able to figure out how to take this raw technology to solve problems which were not solvable before? So I am very bullish on the applications of AI and ML, which makes humans better. Right? There's all this talk about, oh, they can do the work my admin does, right? That's not where the real opportunity is. The real opportunity is, can we apply AI and ML? Because compute, storage, and memory are cheap mm -hmm. to help with drug discovery, yep. to help with precision well, diagnostics. And the data tsunami is another factor too. There's so much data, you need streaming data. You need machine everything. Learning, you need help there. And the machine can do a much better job, if you yep. will, right? Similarly in cybersecurity, right? We can't have humans looking at and staring at like 10, a billion events a day. A machine using AI and ML models can process it and only flag to you the 10 things which matter. Yeah. So that's where I think AI and ML applications will go. Autonomous is another good one. Healthcare is another one. Mm -hmm. um, we just talked about cybersecurity. There could be applications of it in horizontal applications like sales, marketing, HR, to make these individual professionals more efficient, more productive, right? Yep. And as far as the compute and other things is concerned, again, we are in an early innings. Yeah. And that's You're kind where- You're an investor. Yeah, and that's where if you look at it, right, like we are in a data-centric world. We invested in Fungible. Uh, Fungible, the founder is Pradeep Sindhu, the ex-founder and CTO of Juniper, Juniper yeah, Networks. He's awesome. Also, yeah. his co-founder is Bertrand. He was the head of all software at Apple. What these guys are saying is like, hey, today the bottleneck is not CPU. Is Pradeep doing a new deal? Yeah, is it's he... Fungible. He's the CEO of Fungible. We backed it two years back. You should talk to him. I love, he's a great person. I yeah. love, he's, he's an a, amazing guy. He's so right? smart. And still going at the age yeah. he's going yeah, at. He right? is phenomenal. So Fungible thesis is sim simple. Microprocessors are hitting the Moore's law. They can only do so much thing, and what's been the tendency? You throw everything at the CPU. Yep. It bursts. GPUs are a good example. You offload floating point processing, you offload graphics processing, AI processing. Performance goes up. You can do more job with smaller space. So what's Fungible trying to do? In a data-centric world, they're saying, like, hey, if you look at people are running networking, security, storage yeah. functions, streaming functions on the CPU, why don't we just offload them? So anything which is data centric or IO centric, run it on my co-processor. Yeah, so too, we're going to see more yeah, and I, more of this stuff. I think you're right, you mentioned earlier, silicon, silicon is in vogue again. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting, I saw a post by uh, Steve Lasowski, he was an ex-former Microsoft guy, just wrote a story around how Intel missed mm -hmm. a big wave, because they were 
they were so focusing on what their architecture was, they missed some of the new things. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA comes right in, so we've been seeing what NVIDIA is doing. I still think there's a whole nother silicon generation coming. This is what you're saying. Absolutely. AI on the chip, things are going to be on the chip because Tesla is still a computer. Correct. Right? We're going to see more of that, right? And I think the AI chips won't just be the training chips where NVIDIA is going. They will also be chips which go into autonomous. They'll also be chips for inference which go into cameras. So this whole area is very, very fascinating where not only will you have CPUs, they don't go away, you'll have GPUs, you'll have vision chips, you'll have sensing chips, you'll have inference chips, you'll have network processors that are going to get built. So the whole area which was written off in the last decade is going to come back. Naveed, great to have you on. I want to get your final thoughts on cloud and cloud native. Obviously the IT world being decimated by uh, what cloud's doing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear if the folks who've been doing DevOps for years saw this coming, but I think now we're seeing mainstream this tornado hit IT. Yep. Um, uh, impact to IT is pretty obvious. Automation, DevOps, mm -hmm. infrastructure as code, microservices are certainly going to do that. But one thing I want to get your reaction to is that the cloud is horizontally scalable. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned databases. Mm -hmm. So that changes the, the notion of a stack. Yep, it does. Your thoughts and reaction to that, because that, that is a landscape altering event. Horizontally scalable resources. When the world was stovepipes of vertical stacks. Correct. Your thoughts. And I think my feeling on that is, I tend to agree with you, right? The world is moving towards scale out, not scale up and it's moving to hyperscale. Not web scale or not the scale we used to have in the traditional database world. Mm -hmm. And I think what this will do is, what we have seen with Amazon, right? Making compute a commodity, making storage a commodity, and now we are moving into the containerized world, but soon we are going to go into the serverless world. So our belief is this underlying technology is going to create an opportunity to redefine the complete application stack and the way software is written, the way the applications are built, and this is not any different than happening. what happened with mainframe, yeah. going to client server computing, going to web, going to mobile, and now to cloud native, right? So I think this pendulum yeah. in IT architecture changes every 10 years, and when that happens, the whole stack gets redefined. Yeah. And right now we are only seeing custom applications, but think about all the SaaS apps you have. How will they run on a serverless architecture? Can you have a different kind of pricing model? Rather than charging per user per month, could it be transactional based? So a lot of new things essentially are Watching. going to happen, right? And then you have the whole notion of decentralized computing, yeah. where now you can run compute on nodes which are not used, you can build a CDN yeah. using blockchain. You can build a new Dropbox using essentially blockchain on unused decentralized nodes. So it's going to be a very interesting time on how this whole hyperscale, microservices, horizontally scalable stuff comes along with peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized computing. Naveen, great to have you on. What's next for Mayfield? Yeah, dry powder in the fund? How Lots of left? dry powder in the fund, <laughs> yeah. only like 35% invested from our new fund and just looking for entrepreneurs. What size checks are you guys writing? What kind of check sizes are you guys writing? It varies, right? Yeah. Like uh, a seed deal is essentially 250K to a million dollars. Series A's are trending up. They're more from like four to $10 million from us. Mm -hmm. And we do selective B's which are like eight to 14 million. But the A inflation has been there and it's like four to $10 million from a single VC. And on A, they had to have product up and running, obviously. No, a lot of the companies we are backing, they're paper and pencil ideas. And At the main reason, that's, absolutely, that's... the main reason is, it's all about people. <laughs> yeah. And if you back great people, they'll build the product yeah. and they'll get the product market fit, if you will. Well, congratulations, Mayfield. I've always known them as a great firm, 50 years old blue chip venture capitalists. Thanks for coming, appreciate it. It's a pleasure being here, thank you very on. much. Cube conversation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.